According to the CDC, it's estimated that 1 in 54 or 1.8% of children have autism spectrum disorder. Autism is four times more common among boys than girls. 9.4% of children are estimated to be ADHD, again more common among males than females. What are these conditions and what does it mean to be neurodiverse? I'm Stephen Jones. I was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder at the age of 26 and it left me wondering how we didn't catch it sooner. As someone who identifies as autistic and ADHD, I wanted to speak to other individuals on the spectrum and get their side of the story and give a testimony to what it's like being neurodiverse. So that led me to some incredible people and I cannot thank them enough for their time. So without any further ado, here's the interviews. I'm a Temple Grandin. I'm a professor at Colorado State University in the Department of Animal Science. I teach a class in livestock behavior, I do research on livestock behavior. I've been there now since 1990, and um, I really like it out here in Colorado. Hi, my name is Alex Kessler. I'm the CEO and president of Kess. We're a toy and game and puzzle manufacturer that makes all these cool spring summer toys and puzzles that you see behind me. I also am the host of the Masters of Modern podcast and the MMCast YouTube channel, plus my own Twitch channel, Kess Wiley, as well as just an internet magic person in general. And I was diagnosed with ADHD combined type in the summer of 2020 uh, at the age of 32, which is how old I am right now. So relatively recently. My name is Andy. I am an autistic person who runs a YouTube channel called Indie Andy. I'm 28 and pretty much the main objective of my YouTube channel is to spread awareness, spread acceptance and, you know, just share my life online, really. That's pretty much the aim of what I do. And that's pretty much me in a nutshell, to be honest. <laughs> Cody Warner. I'm a video creator, so I do some freelance video and... Uh... Video, you know, video for clients, that sort of thing. But I also make videos on YouTube. I vlog sometimes. I make like tutorial content sometimes. I do like inspirational, motivational stuff sometimes, adventure stuff sometimes. So very eclectic YouTube channel. That's me in terms of what I do, in terms of who I am. I'm a, a husband and a father. Love to have fun. Love to meet people, get in relationships with people and play games and go on adventures. The first stone spear was probably made by, you know, somebody who was mildly on the autism spectrum. You see, it's truly a spectrum. You're talking about something that's totally embedded in the genome. Man, if you got rid of it, everybody's probably going to be stupid. There's a new book that just came out, Simon Baron Cohen, on patterns. And, and I uh, basically agree with him when he says that um, a lot of inventors on the autism spectrum. And then you on the other end of the spectrum, you get somebody who remains nonverbal, may have epilepsy on top of it. But some of the nonverbal individuals can learn to type independently. Hmm. And they almost have a locked in syndrome. They can't control emotions in their body. And there's some really good books out now, like Tita Makapata, Hey, How Can I Talk If I Don't Move? If My Lips Don't Move. It's he's uh, types completely independently, Carly's Voice, and then the sequel to The Reason I Jump. These are people that type independently. Typing is something, okay, I want to try to get little kids to talk, but you're getting up to five or six and they're not talking. That's when they need to introduce the keyboard. And the thing that's probably going to work the best is a tablet. It's because when you type on that tablet, the print appears right next to the keyboard. So you don't have to do a tension shift. That's why the tablet, iPad or something very similar is you can just use a text messaging program. Making a big brain is kind of a messy proposition. And there's a whole lot of genes involved. And it's not clear cut. I think it's part of just normal variation. I, you're not going to get rid of autism. The same genes that make the brain big are involved with autism and schizophrenia. In autism, you get extra growth in certain parts of the back of the brain. In schizophrenia, the network's kind of skimpy. And then in late adolescence, it falls apart and then you're going to start hallucinating and doing stuff like that. They're opposite developmentally. But what I learned on the autism is it's embedded into the basic genetics of making a large cerebral cortex. The genetics of ADHD and autism, about a third of it's the same. Hmm. 
a lot of it, a lot of the symptoms, sensory issues, problems like sound sensitivity, sensory oversensitivity. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of it, uh, social awkwardness. Um, there's a lot of overlap. See, the problem is these are not definite diagnoses. It, when, do, when does it become severe enough to call it a diagnosis? It's not a hard diagnosis, hmm. like you got tuberculosis or you got COVID. But there's other things where brain traits, it's, it's all continuous trait. And one is a little moody become bipolar. There's no black and white dividing line. There's too much stuff here. And I'm trained as a hardcore biologist. Now I wanna make emphasize that, okay, what you're born with is not totally your destiny. You know, there's too many kids that are visual thinkers like me just getting addicted to video games. <laughs> they need to learn how to make video games, not just play them all day. So I was diagnosed actually this last summer. I was diagnosed with ADHD combined type. So there's like two sides of the spectrum um, that you can be on and like what used to be kind of ADD and ADHD. And they've kind of got rid of that and made it more of a spectrum. And I'm just like smack dab in the middle of it. ADHD combined type takes like the side, I think it's like presenting and I forget the other one. Um, but basically there's the like more space cadet version of ADHD. And then there's the like very hyperactive, can't uh, sit and focus on, on things. And th these are very generalized versions of what this means. And then I am both of those things, which actually is one of the reasons they had trouble diagnosing me when I was a kid because I had the ability to both hyper-focus on things very easily. So, and one of the things I hyper-focus on is conversations with people. So they thought, oh, he can talk to people for more than 30 seconds. That, that means he probably doesn't have it. And so they like, and, and I wasn't seeing an actual ADHD specialist. My parents got divorced. So I was like seeing a talk doctor to talk through that process. But that then led to kind of a misdiagnosis from them. And then my parents never really pursued it uh, until... Um, this last year where because of the quarantine or the COVID uh, situation, I had like time available to handle doctory things that I had been putting off for a long time. And one of them was uh, finally going through the official testing process. And I like passed, I guess pass is a weird word to use here, but was diagnosed with flying colors. <laughs> My diagnosis is uh, ADHD without mention of hyperactivity was how it was written on the on the paper. The without mention of hyperactivity is actually really funny to me because like most people I know wouldn't necessarily know I have ADHD, but they would say, yeah, Cody's one of the most hyper people that I, that I know, you know, the perception the doctor had of me, I wasn't giving off that, that part of my vibe, I guess at that point, but, um, got diagnosed with it when I was, I think 28. So, uh, almost six years ago now. So I had been married for four years. I owned my own business at the time and I had been trying to run it for about two years and just started day in and day out coming up against how incredibly distracted I was and how not just distracted, but like hyper-focused on other things that weren't product productive for the business. I had always done that but i had it, it had never really negatively affected my life until i was married i was supposed to be providing for my family i was supposed to be working hard i was supposed to be you know moving up in the world and i wasn't doing that i was like binge watching breaking bad you know what i mean it was like just a really kind of clash of who i wanted to be and who i was and I started really sort of panicking, like, this isn't right. You know, like I, I need to fix this and I can't pull myself up, self up out of this. And, you know, I had always known slash thought, thought slash known that I had ADD or ADHD. For me, it was like, it, it just never was an issue. Like it never, it never was ruining my life until that time. And so that's what prompted me to go to the doctor and actually get, get diagnosed with it to try out, you know, to, to try medication or, or, and, and counseling and see, you know, is there a way for me to overcome this? I was 
age five when I was officially diagnosed. I don't I don't know how it just it just was a was a thing. They just picked it up early, I guess. Knowing that I kind of had this condition that made me different was I don't know weird. It was very weird in a way because I didn't know about my diagnosis until I was 10. But basically all I knew was that socially I I don't know didn't really make friends the traditional way and I guess academically as well I had quite a lot of help um through school and things um so even though it was like the norm for me it was still really weird I guess Einstein did not talk until he was three he would definitely be in special ed today and people can argue about a precise autism diagnosis, there is no precise diagnosis. It's basically a behavioral profile. I wasn't completely fully verbal until age four, uh, where I could really, you know, yak fast. Uh, and I was lucky to get really good early intervention. That was really important. Also, my mother always encouraged my ability in art. Take the thing the kid's good at, build on it. Because one really common thing with kids that have different kinds of minds is uneven skills. They'll be good at one thing and bad at something else. Let's build up the thing they're good at. And in my career of working on livestock design, I use my visual thinking skills. And when you study biology, you've got the um, axon of the ner ner each neuron, the nerve tail. Well, they form bundles. And I've got big cable bundles uh, for visual thinking that are really huge. And that showed up on an experimental MRI, which is not uh, commercially available. That was basically uh, scientists having fun with the MRI machine when you get the new technology. And that the, the, it's a type of MRI called a uh, high definition um, a tensor imaging. It was invented by Walter Schneider at the University of Pittsburgh and uh, originally uh, designed for looking at head injuries. You see, you get head injury, you have rip fibers. Now, some other things that showed up is I had less fibers for speaking. And that's why I had trouble getting my speaking out. So what you do in the early therapy is the fibers you got left, you increase the bandwidth on the fibers you have left if you work them. Okay. I, I kind of like to use computer analogies because I think it makes it easy to understand. And that technology is sitting in the hospital right now, but um, nobody's looking at using it. The biggest thing that I've run into with friends and my wife and, and um, you know, like adult relationships is sometimes people misunderstanding my uh, distractibility for me not caring about them. That is like further, furthest from the truth. You know, it's like I, I do actually care very deeply about my friends and family and people I love. And whenever I catch myself like being distracted by something or interrupting somebody or anything that I do that, that I know is kind of a result of, of being someone with ADHD, it just really, it can bum me out. And it's been so super refreshing for people who do get to know me better and become like my very good friends that they'll laugh about it, you know, and just in a loving way and say like, I'm just so glad I know you because if I didn't, I would, I would take this as you being very rude, you know, and I'm also hundred percent. Okay. If you like call me on it. And if you, and if you ask me to not do that stuff, you know, it's just that some of that stuff is really hard for me. Same thing with being late. You know, I, I just, it was while I was daily vlogging that I realized I am constantly late and it really started to like, I really started to get very down on myself about it, not because I was late, but because of how that made the other person think I didn't respect them, you know, and that again, that wasn't the case. So those are the two things is that I'm like, I'm not trying to be rude. I just am being very rude. And I thank you for your, your grace with me. You know, I was super lucky in school because I, I would get really interested in certain topics in class and then 
be able to focus on them. The other thing that made me really lucky in school was it, it quickly became a game for me where it was like, how can I pass this class without having to study or do anything? I just want to, I just want to be the best, but I also don't, I want to apply zero effort. And like that game in and of itself made most classes fun uh, for me to uh, figure figure that out and and do well on tests and and stuff. I think that's a different story than a lot of people have, you know, especially kids who get diagnosed at a younger age. Because like probably the reason they get diagnosed is because their teachers are noticing stuff, something's going on, and and we need to try to help um, this person. And that just wasn't that wasn't happening for me. I grew up with my dad. Sometimes the teacher would call or at the parent conference, you know, they would say like, Cody doesn't do his homework ever. And you need to, you know, you need to make him do that. And my dad would just say like, yeah, but he gets A's on tests. So like, why would I have him waste his time doing this work that you're giving him? Like, that's not how someone with, with our, which I found out later on in life, homework is very hard for someone with ADHD because A, they're not even, they're not interested in it but B, they see no benefit in it. You know, it's like, it literally feels like just a waste of time. That's why sometimes I would get B's is because like 20% of the grade was the homework grade. And I, since I didn't do that, you know, I, I wouldn't get a grade there. I would say definitely socially, it was a massive challenge for me finding friends and things. I didn't really have like a group as it were that, came much later on in life really and in terms of academically I guess as well I kind of had to figure out my own way of doing things that works for me because uh, I think in education it's very much like this the way that you have to do things it might work for some people of course it might but for me it wasn't necessarily the case so it was just about finding out what worked for me and I guess socially as well, it was finding out what worked for me and running with it. We went to my 10 year anniversary, uh, me and my wife and, and the principal was there and, and we were a small like liberal arts high school. There's only like 76 kids in my graduating class. So the principal knew all of us. And my wife was asking like, how is Alex as a student? And he was like, well, you know how like you have to legally go to school? <laughs> like you have to go, like there's no way you cannot go to high school. Alex definitely fell in the category of kids who didn't need to be here, but had to be here, which was a compliment, but also definitely not a compliment. Always a C student would just never, and, and, and every report card was basically like good in class, participatory, talks too much, and uh, doesn't do any homework. Like was basically like everything <laughs> you could do well. I, one of the most like ironic moments in high school was senior year. And we all got our like end of semester report card or like where we were standing. And like no normally my school is pretty lax and let you kind of fix this if something was going wrong. But we all got our, our report cards and I had like a big D on mine. And the girl who would sit behind me every time, like, how the fuck do you have a D? And she showed me and she has an A. And I'm like, I don't know. I just don't do my homework or whatever. She's like, I have only passed this class because I'm cheating off of you of every test. It's interesting because there's two sides. There's always a like... There's, I either have, I'm already good at this, so I don't need to do the homework, right? Like I, I'm already naturally good at this thing. So why put the work in that's meant to help me become good at it if I'm already good at it? And that was always what happened with math, right? And then, so like, oh, I'm doing busy work, right? I'm, I have to do this homework, but it's just problems that I can do already. Why am I doing it? And then I would do all in the test and it wouldn't be an issue. Or the inverse of that, which is, oh, I'm bad at this. And I hate that. <laughs> so I don't want to do it because I don't want to figure out how to be better at this thing because that's a struggle that my brain doesn't want to deal with. So like, there's like a weird happy medium of like being already good at it and it being fun, which is why I think so many people are driven towards nerd activities that have mm -hmm. ADHD, right? Like that's why they like video games. That's why they like doing these things. Cause it's like, oh, I'm already good at it, but there's a challenge involved but the purpose is a challenge. So it, like, there's something that's entertaining about it, but I, I can be talented at that thing at the same time. And it's not like miserably, like there's no reward for doing homework you're bad at other than like you kind of get to know what it is, but, and then there's no reward for doing homework you're already good at. So I didn't do any homework. 
socially, I was always fine. I always survive best in large group of friends um, because I think I have trouble more often than not being in one-on-one friendship relationships. I've always found myself in a, a minimum trios of like three friends that were really good or larger. And like classically would be the person bringing more and more people into our group of friends. Like I've, I've always like fallen into friends of people that are like all relatively judgy. And then my job was to like, be the person to bring people into the group and see if they would fit because I would always just like gather large groups of friends pretty much every environment I've ever been in and I like the, my most depressed points in life were when I wasn't in didn't have a large social circle that I had available to me so I, I've had two issues th- a few issues socially one of them would be like addicted to social interaction right like one of the reasons I think I had so much trouble in college was I would just prioritize hanging out with friends or doing social interaction versus working on schoolwork. So it's much more of a, para, I guess parasocial isn't the right word, but like a addiction to social interaction and, and, and having people around. And one of the reasons I think I've been able to be successful in the business I'm running is I like to roll deep. So I'm able to actually have a team around me at all times and I've made it much more of a team environment. In fact, I don't even have an office uh, where I work. There's there's also a level of like, there's something called, and I always for RIS, RISD or something along those lines. And basically it's a, it's a um, social interaction anxiety piece to having ADHD um, and basically if I and it, and it generally involves into you being a very like a people pleaser which I definitely am where uh, I don't I always focus on when I'm interacting with people even friends that I've had for my whole life on small things they may have done to uh, uh, bother them and so when you exit those things, other people might not be focusing on those micro aggressions or micro things that they did. And like, I just start freaking out that they like hate me. And so because of that, then I'm much more about like making sure everyone's happy. And I'm definitely a people pleaser, which has led me to have really good friendships over a long time. But even now I have friends that like, I have known since I was 12, but I will assume that they don't like me half the time. Um, And that I think, and that is like confirmed a part of the diagnosis. Where I had the worst problems was high school. Uh, That was the worst part of my life, bullying. And the only places I was not bullied was where I had a shared interest with other students, horseback riding, model rockets, or electronics. So I'm a big proponent of getting friends through shared interests. That is really important. It could be music. It could be playing drums. I noticed the drum set you got there in the back. Yeah. And I... Got it lighted up nicely because you know it's in your background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I figured that was deliberate. That's what you got to do. Get kids out, you know, doing things. Now, the other thing is how do kids get interested in things? I got interested in horses because I was exposed to them. You know, okay, kids get hung up on dinosaurs or whatever, but they get exposed to dinosaurs and movies and, and in school. And one, one thing I think has been really bad is a lot of the schools have taken out the hands-on classes. If I hadn't had art and sewing and woodworking, I would have hated school. That's why I came up with this book here, Calling All Minds. It's all my childhood uh, projects from little helicopters and parachutes, uh, you know, making stuff. Because this brings up the really important thing is when you're different, what I learned to do is to sell my work, not myself. What I would do is I would show off my drawings. And when I did an interview, it basically was a show and tell of drawings, selling the work not myself. That's the key. Like here are some of my drawings right here. And I would just uh, lay my drawings out on the table and they go, wow, you did that? No, I fortunately learned early on, sell the work, not yourself. Or it's programming, you'd show some code you'd written or you'd show an app you made for phone. In other words, show off some of the work. In your books, you talk about the different um, thinking types. Yeah, that's right. I talk about that in the autistic brain. And In the Autistic Brain book, I provide the science for different kinds of minds. There's research that shows. There's some people like me who think in pictures. And the HBO movie showed very, very nicely how I think in pictures. And then another kind of mind is the mathematical mind. They think more in patterns. So I'm what's called an object visualizer. And the other kind of mind is the visual spatial mathematical mind. And there's a number of research studies that apps really support this. And since the autistic brain was published in 2013, there's been a bunch more studies on supporting these two kinds of photorealistic visual thinker like me, and then the more mathematical computer scientist type of mind. And then you've got the person who's the word thinker, who thinks entirely in words. 
I've talked to people that are word thinkers and I didn't really learn how different my thinking was until I was, you know, getting up in my forties, late thirties, early forties. And I kind of, um, one day I asked a speech therapist to uh, access her memory on church steeples. And I was really shocked that, that she just got kind of a generic thing like this, just two lines like this, where I'm seeing pictures and I can name off where they're at. They are specific and they come up like a bunch of PowerPoint slides, except it's sequential. Google image shows it in gallery format. Um, it be, uh, they come up like one at a time. Then if I hold an image, then I can get a little video on it. Then I can get some sound on it. But it, the picture definitely comes up first. Yeah, I think the HBO film really helped to highlight the visual thinking, the, the way that you memorize that textbook page, the professor had you read. I'm not a you know total savant, but one thing I used to do is um, I was really good at biology. I used to tutor the other students. And I would see my handwritten notes where I'd drawn a diagram of maybe the cell, for example. And then I would see that diagram when I took the exam. Uh, if I, you know, let's say they're showing me how to work some ice cream machine or something like that at a restaurant, um, I need to make myself a pilot's checklist, of tear down cleaning steps, because I don't remember sequence. Now, after I'd worked on that machine for two weeks, I could throw the checklist away because I'd have it videotaped into my head. But to start with, I would need to have a written pilot's checklist because I just the long strings of verbal information that just does not work with me. And so, but that's an easy thing to do. And I'm multitasking. You know, the kinds of jobs I've done don't involve multitasking. You're doing design work. Let's say you're doing photography. You're not multitasking. You're concentrating on your photography. For me, it may just be the fact that I'm just a driven person because of the experiences that I've had to, I don't know, just push myself forward and, you know, keep pushing forward. That is just a trait of mine that's really helped and it's gotten me to where I am today, really. I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of creativity you display as well in, in your videos and your presentation of these videos. I, they captivate me and they keep my attention. So I know that's, uh, I don't know. You got, you got, you got a lot, a lot more going for you. I think, you know, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that Steven. Um, I, 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 I don't know. It's, it's really weird when I do videos, I think, because I, I don't know, it's the best version of me and I kind of want to be that version of me all of the time, but I'm just not like, I'm just not like that. Yeah. Cause you're, when you're in front of a camera, you're really, uh, you're putting on, your, your best yeah your best face forward I guess right and but yeah you, you, and and that, and maybe I don't know if that uh that helps with um acceptance of autism or not but I think it's it, it makes it digestible for for other people to to learn about the condition and um I know sharing your videos with my friends and family has helped them to understand me so uh that's great man it's, it's honestly really great I think I think the reason why I do the videos the way that I do them is to make them digestible to people because kind of the way I see it is if the people that I'm trying to just reach reach for don't understand then I'm kind of not really doing what I want to do yeah. so it's a catch-22 I guess I just ended up embracing it and trying to exploit the superpower sides of it the you know the way the doctor the path the doctor took was let's put you on some drugs so i got put on a depression medicine and ritalin so you know depression and then an adhd like a stimulant let's try that out and first started like low dose i think it was 20 milligrams then went up to 40 or maybe we even jumped 40 because like just wasn't working at all went up to 60 and started going to uh counseling to therapy and that only lasted for like maybe three uh three sessions because the therapist the counselor that i went into he opened it up with something on the third session and you know i said something like i just i'm having a really hard time these are some of the issues that i'm experiencing i would love strategies on how to overcome this and he was like he, he was like you know my biggest goal as a counselor uh, therapist is to help people 
become more aware of their own thoughts and their own beliefs and who they are and and some of the things that they're thinking that are causing some of the actions. But it sounds like you, and talking to me, are one of the most self-aware ADHD people that I've ever met. And that made sense to me because I was like, I knew it. I was an adult, you know, I, I got the feeling that maybe he worked with a lot of um, people earlier on. To me, it was almost like he just said, there's nothing I can do to help you. <laughs> you know, it's like you already yeah. do, are doing the things that I try to do to help people like you. And and so that was how it went with the therapist and then with the medical doctor and the drugs. I I definitely got a hit of, you know, the ability to just focus for for longer periods of time on stuff that I wanted to focus on um, at first with the drugs. And then it was only maybe two weeks or so where I started, I just sort of adjusted to this new feeling and went right back to hyper-focusing, but now just with a lot more energy and a lot less sleep than uh, on stuff that I didn't want to be focusing on. And um, it, I was only on those drugs for maybe three or four months before I went into the doctor and said, this stuff isn't good for me. Like, I think I'm getting addicted to it. I'm gaming it. I'm taking like all 60 milligrams at once, just trying to get into a productive state. And like, that's not good. And you know, I don't want it. I don't want this anymore. And he was just sort of shocked. Similar, mm -hmm. similar thing where he's like, okay, you sound like, you know, what you're talking about. So I'll take you off of this medicine, but I don't, you know, I don't know really where to go from there. So I got off of the drugs and and kept working and and kept trying to get better at doing the stuff that I wanted to do. It wasn't really until I started vlogging, I started making a vlog, which really ended up helping me to in two ways. One, it helped me with my sort of executive function where I would say in the vlog, I would to my camera, I would say, you know, I'm going to do this today. And then like just saying that to the camera made me go and start to do that thing because for whatever reason, like it was this little hack that worked. The other thing that vlogging really helped was I still had a full-time job. I was selling videos for my production company. It really helped me with like constantly having something to do and constantly having to be thinking about something else that I also considered productive. Whether I was thinking about what's the vlog for today? Or whether I was thinking about how am I gonna get this next video sale? I could switch thoughts to the other thing and not, you know, and start to make progress on that thing, a bit of a productive procrastination type thing and still feel good about it. So ended up really starting to hyper-focus on the vlog, which at first I think was scary for people around me, but then as it started making money and as things started going well with the vlog, it ended up it ended up being a good thing to hyper focus on. So just constantly trying to go down new creative pathways and like allow myself to get intrigued and distracted by things in my surroundings and then chasing them, but for the purpose of making a video about them ended up being really freeing to me. What I've found like in a formulaic way is like if there's any slight ounce of interest or curiosity about a thing that's a good indicator of me potentially being able to become very proficient at that thing any it works well sometimes with like problems and overcoming problems is and finding a solution to a problem so if there's a rig that i or a shot that i want to get but i'm going to need to build a rig in order to get it i can figure out how to build that rig without spending a bunch of money or, or wasting or taking a bunch of time because of sort of how my brain's working in this very fast problem solving way. You know, just like maybe much more specifically to me, when, when it came to daily vlogging, like the biggest problem that people have with daily vlogs is they're like, and the question I get asked all the time is how do you constantly come up with ideas? And for me is like, how do you not come up with ideas? I have 50, I've had 50 ideas since we started this conversation. Like I, I jot those ideas down and then, and then, you know, maybe I'll come back and look at them, but probably not. Cause I know I'm going to have another 10,000 ideas before next month. So in that way, like 
that that was very good for daily vlogging because you needed a new idea every day and I had more than I could choose from. When it comes to comedy or humor, I think it can, it can go both ways, right? Like sometimes <laughs> people think I'm very much not funny. You know, you I just make so many connections, just random connections between situations and other situations. I am end up being quick and, and coming across as witty because I'm thinking about so much at the same time. You know, people say to me, like, I just wish I could think as fast as you. And so like, you know, that makes it makes you feel like you have a superpower sometimes. What, one thing that, that is interesting is it, it definitely feels like there's been in the last five years, a movement to kind of understand that there is such thing as adult ADHD, and it's not just something for kids. And that if you do feel like you have symptoms, there are more tools available now to help adults find diagnosis. It isn't cheap, which really sucks. But it definitely I think has helped when it first happened, I was like really angry that I wasn't able to get help earlier. There was like a good week where I just like very mad just at the world. Uh, and I think that that sucks, but I do think that getting it has been extremely helpful over the last six months or five months or three months. I, time doesn't exist anymore. 2020 is weird. Did September really happen? Does any, can anyone prove <laughs> that we actually had a September this year? There's a lot that goes along, along with it. I, I think that as far as it's also not like a death sentence, right? It's not like, I think there's a lot of things that I'm better at because I have this condition. I think creatively, I think the fact that like behind me, we've invented all these cool products for our toy company all comes from my ability to jump from project to project. Like I've been, I've been given the opportunity and, and I've been lucky to be able to kind of found my own company that has, that has success behind it. And the tools given to me by having that environment have been really helpful in, 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 in dealing with this on my own or with my family, but on my own than it would have been before that when I was trying to work jobs where I would eventually just like dead end myself or wouldn't succeed. Um, and, and I think that's the ADD side of being able to kind of control your own universe and being able to jump from project to project when it interests you or you need to focus on it has been helpful. I think being able to like go project to project is kind of like one of those superpowers of being neurodiverse or being ADHD. And also the ability to just problem solve like someone brings you a problem and it just, you're already getting a solution by the time they're finishing their sentence kind of thing, you know? Yes. No, the, there's definitely a, I'm very good at problem solving. I'm, I don't have patience for sometimes though, for like walking through how you're going to do something. I'm just like, okay, let's try something. Let's just like, like the first step is do it. And then once we do it, if there's mistakes, let's go back and fix them and see how we can do better. There's also, yeah, the finishing people sentence thing. I definitely annoy people in my life because I like most sentences, you know where they're going to go by the end of the sentence. And so I'm good at halfway through. I know where you're going to get to. And so I like will interrupt them and be like, oh, yeah, yes, that that here's the answer to your question. And they're like, let me finish my question. <laughs> I want to see kids get out there and be successful. Yeah. And I'm seeing too many parents and too many kids getting so much in the diagnosis. I was kind of a shocked when I'm computer science parents don't think to teach their kid programming when their kid is good at math. It doesn't even cost anything to do it. And then you go out to, you know, the tech companies and um, you've got lots of people there that are on the spectrum. Some, the estimates go from 25 to 50%, depending upon the company, especially the programming staff. Now I notice they avoid the labels because yeah. I thought, I think they don't want it to define them. And for me, being autistic, Autistic is an important part of who I am, but being a scientist comes first. Mm. You know, career kind of uh, makes my life worthwhile. The fact that you were able to make a career out of something you loved too, that is incredible. Well, and I, what I've been, uh, when it comes to, you know, building things and doing engineering work, there's kind of two parts of it. There's more mathematical part. And then there's the visual thinking part. Like you take something like Zoom, the reason why it got all the business is because the interface is easy to use. That's visual thinking. But the more mathematically inclined people had to make the code that would make it work. See, that's where you need to have both. You yeah. need to have both the visual thinking minds and the math minds and the skills can complement each other. The Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs type thing and uh, that back and forth of technical engineering and understanding visual aesthetics. Well, a guy that, is, that uh, invented Zoom used to work for WebEx and he wanted to fix up WebEx's interface and WebEx said no. So he left WebEx and started his own company and WebEx is way behind Zoom. 
you had a HBO film made about you. And yep. how many how many books have you now authored? Well, counting three textbooks, I've got about 15 books now. <laughs> wow. You've authored textbooks as well. Yes. On, the, on, on livestock handling, animal welfare, the behavior and genetics of the behavior of domestic animals. I offered some of the chapters in those and other people also offered chapters. And I was the editor of the textbooks. That's remarkable. <laughs> Well, my big concerns is the school's taken out all the hands-on classes. If I hadn't had art, it would have just been terrible. And how could a kid get interested in car mechanics, for example, if they're not exposed to it? Hmm. We have a huge shortage right now of high-end skilled trades, things like mechanics, welders, electricians. These are good jobs. COVID-proof, recession-proof, never going to go away. Always going to be needed. I want to encourage uh, you know, students and stuff. Try a lot of stuff. Figure out what you might want to do. I get asked all the time, how to get in the cattle industry? I was exposed to it as a teenager. It's that simple. And I was just reading, a, there's this wonderful book on, on how to be an astronaut. And, and I, when he was a nine-year-old kid, he went to the museum and saw one of those IMAX movies. That did it. You know, those things are important. That's exposure. Let's show what people can do. But... I'm one thing I'm very concerned about, and 10 years ago, I wouldn't have talked about this much, is not learning life skills, shopping. I'm just appalled at the amount of smart teenagers on the spectrum, never gone shopping, never learned to manage money. The way I understood money is I had to save two weeks for that 69 cent airplane because 50 cents wouldn't cover it. And I look back on this, I'm realizing what an important thing I learned from that. And that's not hard for parents to do. Because to understand money, I have to make it translate money into real things I can buy. It, it can't be abstract. And my favorite toy when I was about 10 years old was table hockey set. Now, that, of course, was a Christmas present. There were things that were like more expensive. I remember seeing that in the, in the, in the shop window. And it was $21. And it would be almost my whole year's worth of allowance. I remember looking at that in the shop window. I already had the hockey set. But I learned a really uh, important thing about value of money. I didn't realize how important what I learned with my little 50 cents of allowance was until maybe about five years ago. And I'm seeing some of the problems that people are having and they weren't taught these basic things. I was taught to save. And I remember being very disappointed. I wanted to buy this airport thing. It was in the same toy shop as the hockey game. It had a crank on it and the flying saucer would take off. I, it was like $3. I saved up for it and they had sold it. And I didn't know that maybe the store could order another one. When I was 10, I didn't know that. What do you want the average person to know about this diagnosis? Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing is it's real. <laughs> Uh, like that, that was definitely the thing. And even like the fact that I didn't get diagnosed until I was much older was partially just cause there's this whole vibe that it doesn't exist or like, it means like something is wrong with a person or like it, it, like, I think I, especially my generation grew up in an era where people just thought that people being diagnosed or just parents not being able to handle rambunctious children or like, and, and there's a difference between trying to like deal with a kid in a way that maybe isn't healthy and like actually helping them and make sure they're having the tools to succeed. A lot of my life has definitely been much harder and a windier road than maybe it would have been if I had had just like guidance or help or, or any of these kind of tools that were made available to some of my peers. I don't think I would have gone to five different colleges. I think I would have maybe made it through one or we wouldn't have sent me to like a large, you know, 300 kids per class lecture based classroom set setting and put me something a little bit more intimate and smaller that would have helped me been able to kind of like focus on classwork. Talk to a physician and, and push for it. That's the other thing. Like the barriers for an adult to get this diagnosis are pretty, pretty high just from the perspective that it's a lot of things that you're going to be bad at. It's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of asking for help. It's a lot of like, basically if my wife had not been pushing for it and she didn't have her, her therapist recommend a person that was really good who then helped me and like 
had all of these things lined out. I think actually the fact that COVID is happening also helped because it was all through like through email and through through digital interaction. So it was like, oh, I just put a bunch of alerts on my calendar and I'll make sure I'm there. And it wasn't as much like physically having to go somewhere or remembering to be somewhere on time, which I think was helpful. But I think that like there are tools that are out there. There's a ton of really good YouTubers that like do ADHD content that like were really helpful once I got my diagnosis. And, and if you feel like you have it, like it's totally fine to be diagnosed as an adult. It is not just for kids. It's not, it's something that does continue past that. Having help and having people I'm talking to has been much better than before when I was just in a void. I'm like, oh, I guess something's wrong with me. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know why I can't like remember to do things, but I can't and I'm just going to suffer. The thing that I want to just put out is that autism can be challenging they can be hard to live with I've been there where in in my life I didn't want to be autistic you know it was kind of the thing in my life where I was like no I want to be like everyone else but for me it was I guess about trying to find a way of accepting me and once I actually found that through many years it's not something that comes overnight but once I actually found that it was easier to accept me and do you know what I'm happier because of it so really I think it's just about accepting yourself you know and just being proud just being proud of that really my biggest concern whenever I talk about ADHD and how it is for me personally my biggest concern is that it will come across the wrong way to someone who's struggling with ADHD in a very different way than the way that I am struggling with it. Because I'm an optimist, because I'm a fun loving, like happy person generally. And I wasn't, I know I'm not always like this. And I definitely wasn't like this when I was really, you know, right before seeking a diagnosis, that sort of thing, I was really getting into a very uh, depressive state. Because I'm so optimistic, because I'm so fun loving, it can come across as hey, everything's fine. Like ADHD is just a different way of being and it's fine. Like you can just harness the power of it and have a great life, you know? And I just know that that is not the case for many people. And even if it was, which it's not, but even if it was like, they don't feel there yet. And so I don't ever want, like, I just want everybody to A, understand that whatever the diagnosis is, you might just feel it much differently than anybody else. There's not like, that's the great thing about like neurodiversity, right? It's like, it's not, it's not like neurotypical. And then this other thing that's neurodiverse, it's like neurodiverse. Like there's a bunch of different ways to experience this. And, you know, it's my bent to sort of try to find and exploit the positives, but there are a lot of negatives and I don't want to take away from those. The vulnerability piece is just is really huge for me and and was really huge and still, you know, day in and day out. I mean, I feel like there's not a public appearance or speaking gig that I do where I don't mention it at some point in the talk that I have ADHD. And it really I just it's so incredibly freeing to just sort of put it out there and just let everybody know. And And it's you know, it normally elicits a bit of a smile and, um, you know, there's this other side of it where it's sort of like a, a trendy thing to, to talk about having ADHD or, or ADD, you know, you, you hear, hear people say it and they're not talking about it in the diagnosis sense. They're talking about, I had a moment of distraction, you know? And so just letting all of that go and knowing that like, yeah, people are smiling and, and, that's cool, but they don't necessarily get it. Like just letting all of that stuff go is, is really important. And it's still freeing, even though you know that people are going to misunderstand you, it's still very freeing. And then, you know, to take that a step further, there are people in the crowd. There are people that you're talking to who do understand who, who actually have ADHD and maybe they, have never told anybody about it. Maybe they're not public about it or maybe they are or whatever, but like the connection that is immediately built with somebody when you get to share some of these stories is a, like we're a cool community. We're a cool community of people to be a part of. And, 
and just know that you know you're not alone and there's so many other amazing people out there from history and currently living to this day who who have or had ADHD and and uh and did really cool stuff Thank you so much for watching this film and thanks to those who shared their story as this would have been nothing without them. So thank you, Temple Grandin. Thank you, Cody Warner. Thank you, Alex Kessler. And thank you, Andy Burns. Thank you, Mitchell McCracken for helping me edit this. And I hope this film has given you a little insight into what it's like to be neurodiverse.